Dennis is here. If you have any questions about VARA, it's the right time to ask them before he gives his talk. The chemical that the bees produce that signals the Varroa to uh, breed, uh, do they have any purpose for the bee at all? We don't really know what the chemical is, um, but we do know this mite, it, um, it's a parasite of the brood, so it enters at the pre-capping stage of the brood cycle of the bee, it enters the cell there just before it's capped. And so you've got about a 72 hour period in there and it's in there that the mite begins to reproduce. And um, we know that the mite picks up the signal that it needs at, in that 72 hours, because if you look at the way that Varroa reproduces, it reproduces first a, a male offspring and then about five females. And it's a pretty inbred sort of system. The, the brother will mate with his sisters and, and so on. Um, but experimentally, after the female has laid the first egg, which is a male, and then you wait till she lays the second egg, which is a female, you can actually remove her from the cell and hold her outside for a while. And then you can artificially go and make her enter a pre-capping cell again. And, a, and the first offspring she lays is a male. So the clock has been reset. So there's something that that mite is picking up in that 72 hour period. And it's probably got to do with the first feed that it has off the bee. Because after it leaves, it goes into the cell, enters the brood, the brood food at the bottom, like the picture showed there, and then it comes out, the first thing the female does is make the feeding hole. So she drills that at a particular place on the bee. And, um, um, yeah, um, I've just lost my train of thought here. Mr. Uh, yeah, uh, after, the, after the larvae comes out of the brood food, um, it will then make that, that feeding hole, but it has a feed there. And with, with this mite, everywhere it goes in its life cycle, like because it's got no eyes and it's, it just operates in this chemical world, it's just operating on signals everywhere it goes. So it hits a signal and it knows where it is, it knows what it's got to do and, and so on. And so as it comes out of the brood food, it's actually a mechanical sign that the mite gets to come out of the brood food because it buries itself in the brood food right over on the edges of the of the cell and the, the larvae begins to eat the food from the centre of the cell out to the outside. By the time it gets to the outside, it's like the clock, it just sort of hits the mite and the mite can feel the larvae mouth and it hooks onto it and it stands up. So that's, a, that's a, like a mechanical signal. But the next signal it must get is it makes the, 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 the feed hole, it's got to do it at that stage because um, it's um, uh, the, the, cuticle, the cuticle of the larvae becomes a little bit tough if it just waits a little bit longer because the little piercing mouth parts, the chelicery of the mine, can't actually penetrate the skin. So it's got to get in right at this critical little time. And then it has a feed and we believe that that's where it picks up that signal. But we don't know what the signal is, and we don't know what it's, <coughs> how the bee is using that signal. But there's lots of tricks that you can get up to um, down the track. But this is really the first attempt to, to get away from chemical control. That's what I was getting at, I mean, ke uh, chemical yeah. control is what I want to get away from. But I wondered if <coughs> interfering with its um, genes and switching yeah. the signal off could create a bigger problem later on. We may not even have to go to the stage where you're thinking of genetic engineering and, and that sort of thing. I th I'm pretty sure that the first thing you'd obviously do is sort out the system, just sort of say, well, what is it? What's that chemical? How is it interplaying with the, with the mite? And how important it is it to the bee? And then with that information, uh, the first thing I imagine that you do is you'd run around the planet and have a look at all the different Apis mellifera 
and see if they actually produce a profile which is out of sync with the mite. Now, there's some evidence that you could pick that up, like Africanized honeybees, which are a strain, Apis mellifera um, um, cutilata, is it, um, from, from Africa. Um, the mite, it doesn't really recognize the signal very well on that bee. There's something like about 60% of the females that go through their life cycle actually don't lay eggs. So some of them just pick it up and others don't. So there's signs that maybe there's, this, there's bees out there that, that have actually got it and they might be able to just, through conventional breeding and artificial insemination, actually bring some of those traits across into, into mellifera without having to go interfering with the bees' genome. We're all pretty terrified of it arriving here, but we all feel quite impotent in terms of what can we do. Most people don't want to use chemicals. So I contacted Ron because I'd like to, to put what he does on a list, if ever I had one, of ways to deal with it. Um, is anything like that going to be compiled so we all are pre-armed pre with various things we can use? Amateur beekeepers can control this mite without any problem, you know, without, without the need for some of these serious chemicals. You can just do, do it by little tricks like you're talking about. And there's the things called drone cap... Uh, drone trapping where the mite tends to favour drone brood over worker brood because where it come from in history, back on Apis serrana, it can only reproduce on drones. So whenever it picks up that pheromone, it goes there. So people drop comb brood, uh, drone brood in, in colonies and you can suck out, they act like a sink and you can just take that brood out then and destroy it. Um, that might be all right for an amateur. <laughs> But if you're a commercial beekeeper and you've got 2,000 hives, every time you lift a lid, that's time, somebody's time, and that's just not on in a commercial situation. So that's why they use chemicals, because it's so quick and it's so easy, to, uh, it's, it's, it's not so expensive. The chemicals are expensive, but you remove the labour costs out of it. And it's, it's, mm. When you went to Papua New Guinea yes. in the video, um, yeah. essentially you told them, oh, your, your bees are infested. Were you able to stop some of the infestation? Well, oh, it's, you're entering a developed country, yeah, a developing country, you know, an undeveloped country. And um, agricultural systems are not very good there. And um, what, initially what we did is we got... Um, part of the Australian aid program into PNG to buy chemicals um, to, to put them up there. But since that finding in 2008, there's, there's basically been nothing done. And we don't really know what the situation is up there. And um, even just in the last year, we've heard that Tropical Acups has actually arrived as well. And that's another serious parasitic mite and it's, it's across the border in West Irian, but, but those two bee populations are separated, uh, but somehow it's, it's, it's got across. So uh, we're, I intend to go up there this year, but we don't really know what's, what's going on. And again, you get caught up in politics, and, you know, it's like everywhere else, and, and money, and somebody's got to pay for this, and you know, um, in a country like PNG, that's, that's, that's very difficult to get money anywhere. Well, is there any government interest in funding it? Oh, that's always a good question. And I don't do this um, to uh, get funding, even though it's a scary story. Um, but uh, all of my Varroa work, I can tell you over the last 20 years, has been funded on the overseas Australian overseas aid money that's gone out. And so it works both ways. I mean, we give the money out to try and help people in developing countries. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, we try to get some, some, some benefit back to Australia. Now, in the case of this work that I've been doing, it's by trying to help 
beekeepers in Asia, so my projects just haven't ranged in PNG, they've been all through Asia, and they've been mainly funded through the aid, the aid project. There hasn't been really any money that's come out of industry here in Australia. Um, um, uh, we've always operated on a shoestring. Um, at the moment, the work that we want to do on trying to find this chemical, it's just on hold until we try to find uh, where we can get funds from. Maybe un under the new biosecurity CRC that's just got up and operating, we're looking at, at a possibility there. But when you, when you research bees, honeybees, you, you're always going to operate on shoestring budgets. That's the nature of the game. You're chronically underfunded, always. And yet, the benefits are so great. You know, really, the, the, the horticultural and crop industries should be contributing. But um, over the last few years, we've tried to, to, to raise awareness in those industries just how important pollination is to their yields and how it's threatened and how they, they can understand the story all right, but when it comes to putting money on the table, that's a, just not happening. I was just wondering what the status of the Asian honeybees in Cairns region is at the moment. Ah, yes. Well, the, the, this Asian honeybee up in Cairns, it didn't really go into the full story in, the, in that the doco there. Couldn't, because it didn't have time. But it's a really interesting story because it's really the first example where the Asian honeybee has been moved out of its natural area of Asia, basically, mm. and moved outside of that zone by humans. And it happened um, when Indonesia got control of West Papua. And um, after the Second World War, they got that off the Dutch, who were controlling it at the time. And then they started this transmigration program in there, where they were moving peasant farmers from Java across in there and cutting out a bit of rainforest and saying, you've got to make a go of it of which they did eventually, um, based around their Muslim religion and, and close social knit sort of environments, um, they, they made a go of it. But if you go into parts of West Irian now, I could take you in there and close your eyes before I take you in and then take the blindfold off and say, where are you? And you'd probably say, Java, or some place in Indonesia, because you'll see rice paddies and you'll see buffaloes and you'll see goats and everything that you'll see in Java, farmers doing over there. And so as part of that system, they bought in Asian honeybees. And it was once they got them in there in 1977, they just, um, that bee is not normally hived and the Indonesians don't even keep it really for high honey production, they keep it for medicinal purposes. So it, uh, they get a little bit of honey and the lady who circles around the villages, normally it's a lady with a push bike with her medicines on the back, and she'll visit homes and treat people. Honey is part of that. And so they, they use honey for that, not, not, not as a sweetener. Um, so, but it's part of their culture. So they brought them in, but the bees, they don't, they don't hide very well. So they swarmed out, they, they quickly spread throughout West area and down through Papua New Guinea. In 2003, they ended up in the Solomon Islands, 1,500 kilometres to the east. They're up into New Britain, Manus Island. Uh, they're off islands to the south. <coughs> we had an incursion in Darwin in 1998, and that was eradicated. It was just one colony. But then we had another one in 2007, and now that's been declared non-eradicable. Now those two incursions were all part of that invasion process to the north. We know that from DNA, it's the same bee. And uh, uh, every, I think since 1999, we've had nine arrivals at ports that have been intercepted. Something like 80% of those have had varroa mites on them. Uh, 
It's just that they haven't made it onto land. The two, the, the, well, the Cairns one that made it onto land, well, luckily it didn't have mites. It was a single colony initially, but it just didn't have mites. Just one of those things. Um, it could have easily, and probably the next time it lands here it will. So at the moment we have to say, well, the bee is not eradicable. Uh, the government has committed $2 million as part of the transition to management. So now we're learning to manage it. It will eventually spread out of the Cairns area. It's, that's a given. That's a given. Um, it'll come right down, probably right down along the east coast here. As far as we know, it'll go to, into most places where Apis mellifera goes. And it just it's another pest in our environment. It's, uh, it opens up the possibility of, if we do get Varroa, then it'll be just that much more to manage because that bee in the background can act as a host. So it's a major issue. Mm. It seems Varroa has been in Europe for some time, um, and Europeans are still producing a fair bit of food um, with Varroa. I'm just you know, wondering whether you could comment on that, how they're doing it. In Europe, beekeeping is not commercial, basically. Um, if, bee, if, if somebody owns a, a lot of bees, they might own a hundred hives. I mean, an amateur here in Australia can, can own that many. Um, you know, do it on the side. And that's how they'll do it mostly in Europe. So uh, there's no big commercial uh, uh, beekeeping done in Europe, and it's all small scale. And so when you get that situation, you get, as I say, Amateurs can actually control this because labour doesn't become a problem. And, uh, you know, in Europe, e even now, they're, they're picking up little pockets where um, they're finding uh, honeybees that are tolerant to the varroa. So they're just little pockets, and they're little pockets where they've n they're noticing the feral bees are, are starting to come back. But when they look into this and they move those bees into other areas, they find that they're totally susceptible. So it's it's very local stuff that's happening. But it's um, I think the whole thing interfering with this is that honeybees are not like a, a native insect that's out there, and so they're getting um, coming in contact with their pests all the time, and evolution is allowed to operate on its own terms. Humans interfere here all the time and we breed bees and we have our pet uh, races and strains and we mix them and we and we make quiet bees and then those bees swarm and come out, go out into the wild. So we're interfering with the natural play of things all the time. We just don't let evolution run its course. Otherwise, eventually, if you did, you'd probably find that mellifera would actually end up in a relationship with that varroa. I'm visiting Australia. And um, I, I didn't know about this film, and I emailed back to my hive of local beekeepers, and no one had heard of it either. So I'm wondering, you know, if we can't play a little like the mite ourselves, and how available is this film for dissemination? Because, um, again, this, it, it has a potent message, mm -hmm. and um, just to be having the conversation, I think, is a good thing. And the conversation is happening, at least I know, in our communities up there. But, um, you know, that every university's science department could have a copy of this and have the conversation going in the agriculture and blah, blah, blah. You know, I just see that it has some potential for um, just getting the word out there, so to speak. So I just didn't know how available this film was. Yeah, well, you can buy it from Screen Australia in in New South Wales, but I think the best thing about this this doco was that Qantas actually put it onto their in-flight um, mo movie thing. I flew United, sir. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and um, look, I got some. I had some incredible calls from from even I had a lady from NASA actually call me up and saying, "Oh, I watched your movie on the way home on the Qantas flight the other night." He said, oh, "That was fantastic." Can you get me a copy? So I did. But um, yes, but you can get it from from um, Screen Australia there, and it's it's on the web. You just have to sort of tune in.
<laughs> get out of the hive, right, and get in the technology. Okay, thank you. But I'll just tell you where the current situation is with Varroa and uh, what next. With Varroa, we know that Varroa <laughs> is basically a natural parasite of these Asian cavity nesting bees, of which the principal one is Apis serrana. We also know that in the middle of last century, um, some mites switched from that, that Asian honeybee to the European honeybee. And the story actually showed how that actually happened. So what have we really found out about Varroa um, since, since that first initial brush stroke there? We've, all, we've, no, we've known that the Asian honeybees have been a pest. Nobody's done much work on them. Up until about 10 years ago, we basically didn't know a great deal about Varroa. But now we know that basically um, the genus actually has four species in it, probably a couple more. Um, I've listed the species down the side there. This is just a phylogenetic tree. Uh, there's four species. This group in the middle here, there's probably, there's a couple of other species in there, probably. But it hasn't been resolved just yet. But we know that there, there are at least four species in there. Um, we know that um, this is important from a biosecurity point of view. We know that each one of those species carries certain gen genotypes of the mite. And those genotypes come off particular genotypes of the bee. So on the right-hand side here, I've got a phylogenetic tree of the bee. And just to show you that the red clump of bees holds the red clump of mites. The blue clump of bees, the blue clump of mites. So the bee from, from say, Korea, which is in the blue group, will hold a Korean mite from Varroa destructor. So whenever we get now a bee arriving at the wharf in Australia, we just have to get it, sequence its DNA, and then we say, ah, we know what mite you've got now, without even knowing if, if they've got mites or, or not. Um, we, we will know what mite they have. So that's, that's an important bit of information. Um, as far as the host switches goes, um, as the story pointed out, the host switches are only relatively recent and they happened about the middle of last century. Up until then, the Western honeybee, the European honeybee and the Eastern honeybee were separated. They were brought together by humans, introducing them, the Western honeybee, into the Eastern honeybee zone. Um, now, when we have a look at all those bees that are on the Asian honeybee, all those mites, we say, okay, which ones have moved across onto the, the European honeybee? There's basically only three types, these three I'm putting up here, a Korean and a Japan form of destructor. And as you saw in the movie, this one, this Java form of Jacobsoni, which moved across in 2008. Um, when we've done microsats, it's a special technique when you get down there and you have a look at the, at the variation within, say, the Korean and the, and the Japan one on Apis mellifera. Wherever you find those two mites on Apis mellifera, they're, the, they're a clone. There's no variation in them, which tells us that way back when the shift first occurred, say, of the Korean one, which is the most common, that that population probably originated from one single female who just got lucky and was able to recognise those signals. I was telling you about. Um, the invasiveness of it, well, um, the Japan type hasn't spread very far out of Japan. The PNG one is still restricted to PNG, but the Korean one, we know that it originated from around the Korean Peninsula that then spread in, into that area, uh, in, into Europe in the 1970s through to the 1990s. It jumped from there to the Americas in 1988. And then since then, that's been it. And so basically it's all around the world. That little strip in, a, in Africa there, I, 
Nobody's ever reported it there, and I questioned some African guy about it one, one night, and he said, Dennis, have you ever tried to go into the middle of Africa there? Man, you'd never get out. You'd, you'd, be, you'd be walking on landmines everywhere you go. Nobody's going to go in there looking for bloody brown mites. You know? <laughs> so that's probably why they haven't been... But you could basically say that the mite has gone all around the planet. It got into New Zealand in 2000, um, and that's the Korean form of destruction. So we know a lot about, about the invasiveness of it for the control, as we've just pointed it out. The way you, you're trying to control it is because the mite reproduces on the brood here, enters at the pre-capping, produces offspring that spreads viruses. You're trying to stop the build-up of the mite, and that's where you're trying to stop it, at the brood cycle. The only way that we can do it at the moment is with chemicals. and um, Or if... There are these little tricks that you can play, but amateurs, th those tricks are left up to amateurs or people that have got plenty of time to fiddle around with their beehives. Um, the only way that we can do it in a commercial situation is with chemicals. Uh, despite all the effort that's put into Varroa worldwide, we still haven't got a permanent control for it. Um, and com complicating the whole Varroa thing, we've now got this Asian honeybee problem to our north. And I just explained a little bit about that, how it happened in 1977, spread, and um, it's now causing problems up north of Australia. So what next for Australia? Well, I think it, if we're all realists, we'd have to say that we're all might going to get here eventually. Um, freaky if it didn't. There's so many avenues by which it can get in. So, I think the things we can only do what we're doing now is we're trying to improve surveillance. Um, we've, uh, we've got some people here from B Force that are, that are participating in that, uh, so that's great. We've got the na a national sentinel hive program that operates around the ports where we put in sentinel hives and um, and we, we monitor those on a regular basis to look for mites. That's just in case a mellifera from, say, another country arrives on a boat, swarms on land that we don't know about because it looks like ours, except it's got mites, so we, we check those central types of mites and diseases. Um, develop a varroa contingency plan, that's underway. Improve education, we've got Padilla here at, at, the, at, it, at, um, at the museum here, that's got a, a, a section on um, exotic pests of, uh, of honeybees. Um, and, and it's a great site for, for identification. You should go on the The pictures are really good. Um, and, and things like this improve the education and, of course, the research. Um, and we're doing... I've got a postdoc that's looking at aspects of that morale mite up in BNG at the moment. And what I'm trying to do is run around to get funding for my pet project, which is to find a way in which we can get away from chemicals. Um, we're in a privileged state here in Australia at the moment of not having the mine. Um, so we don't have to just run with the chemical track. Uh, we don't have the mine. So we've got a bit of time, and that time I believe we could spend most productively by trying to find a cure for once it gets here, um, which is not reliant on, on chemicals. And as I say, my idea and it's based on the science that we've found so far, is that, that these two circles at the top, they represent the two types of mites we have <coughs> on the planet. We have basically harmful types to European honeybees, and we have harmless types. We only have a K, a J, and a Java type of Jacobsoni as a harmful type, so three types. We know that the K and the J originated from probably one female, the evidence that we're getting on the Java type is, so, is pointing to that same thing. So we've had three females out of a bunch of millions and millions of mites on Asian honeybees that have been able to make the jump onto mellifera. The majority of mites on the Asian honeybees are harmless to mellifera because they basically can't reproduce on the brood, on this brood. So what we've got here with the harmful types they enter here at the pre-capping stage of the bee during the 72-hour stage of pointing out. And the end result is that over there you can see the offspring 
they, the females re reproduce and they do that on the work of all the drone brood and they produce offspring. These other harmless mites, they do the same thing in the life cycle except they, the situation down the bottom there ends up where the females, they make the feeding hole and can sit there and feed on the bee but they don't produce offspring. So they're harmless basically. So well, after that, somewhere in the 72 hour period we're after that chemical signal that, that uh, will allow us maybe to switch off those three mites. That's, that's the idea. But the, I guess the, 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 it's, it's a good way forward into understanding a bit more about the, about the, um, the um, biology of this mite and its relation to honeybees. Just the last slide that I'd just like to put on, it's a bit of, of um, where I come from, is that um, um, I think that we, sh we actually should care about our bees a little bit more. Um, there's not enough people that are aware of, of the importance of bees, but bees are incredibly important to us as humans, um, that, that they're an important part of the food cycle, and as our population grows, bees become more important. Um, we, got, we have reports coming in from around the planet that bees are under threat, that, 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 that bee numbers are diminishing in some countries. We don't know why. At the heart of the bees is the European honeybee as far as pollination goes. It's our major pollinator. And it's responsible for most of the yields of the, of the, of the uh, crops that we need that rely on pollination. It's done by European bees. All those bees are under stress from the system that they're just living in. Um, and that system just seems to be getting worse and worse. We're, we're out there. It's part of modern agriculture. There's more sprays. Um, the, there's the movement of inter through international trade. You saw people switching bees between countries. It's just done now. It's part of the, part of the system. Chemical companies are growing crops and then uh, the crops are all the same genotype uh, because they're reliant on chemicals that they can use to get rid of weeds. Um, you know, as the economy, the urban sprawl is affecting the poor. All I'm, I'm saying is that we should actually care a little bit more about our bees. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you.